Sequelae. Sequela, noun, from the Latin for follow. The same root as sequel. Definitions, one, A, pathology. A morbid affection occurring as the result of a previous disease, chiefly plural, sequelae. B, transferred sense, a consequence. Two, a person's followers, rare. Slavery. In preparing this talk, I scribbled sentences for several months in the hope that I could discover in them a coherence for you, but with a premonition that I would not. This anxious mode of composition is familiar to me, and more than that, since anxieties are hardly limited to writing, one of the clearer ways language has served me as the elucidation of experience. Here I must stop, however, with regret, for I would like to move on, turn from the experience to its elucidation, but I have given myself the task today of speaking as honestly as I can about my process and what it teaches me, or rather processes, plural, and what they teach me, since it is the involvement of language in other dynamics that makes the task worth attempting at all. An admission then, I spent more days than I care to count deliberating the wording of the previous lines, another form of anxious composition revising them, reconsidering them, replacing them, restoring them, arriving at last at the strange locution serves me, which settled my unease by allowing my thoughts to remain unsettled. The issue was one of mastery, of craft, control, duty, agency, and more was at stake than the meager few sentences I had managed to write. Is it indeed for me that language does service? its performance rendered at my command? Or am I instead the one served up, a performance beholden to somebody else? The strangeness of serves me is not merely the ease with which it suggests both. Withdrawn into a variety of forms, the word serve is eminently adaptable, altering or altered by varied circumstance, observing, preserving, conserving, reserving, deserving, undeserving. But ease is not quite the right word for this ability to suggest. If ambiguity is meaning unbound, however little, then the ambiguity of serves is a freedom burdened by memory, by what we ordinarily call etymology. It carries into my anxious scribble across the centuries a Roman experience of slavery, servus. memory. Watching my hand set down these words, their meanings and effects ever manifesting history, I wondered if the two possibilities I had outlined were sufficient. Me the master of what I write, writing the mastery of what I am. Is there no place for manumission, I wondered, a letting loose of control, a freedom from constraint, if not from history itself, Words released along a trajectory that leads from their slavery, however little the distance traveled. Is this not what etymologies propose, whatever their derivation? A loosening of ties, sometimes so loose the origin is lost? At any rate, the etymology of serve suggests such a manumission. It also corroborates the Passover service, the Seder, in its ritual citation of Deuteronomy. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt and that the Lord your God redeemed you from there. A verse usually directed at the youngest in attendance who asks the famous four questions, triggering the retelling of the Passover story. One of my earliest memories involves learning the questions, memorizing Hebrew I could not understand and that I no longer recall. It's the process of learning, the ritual that stays with me. Often the verse is recited by all, but with a change of pronoun. This is what God did for me when I was a slave. More than a moment of passionate identification, the me and I are affirmations of community, a means of assembling what history has scattered, a calling to order, and Seder means order, 
In other words, they serve a compositional function. Of course, they also say serve a lie. And the older I get, the less inclined I am to participate. Ritual be damned. I know too well the abyss between generations slavery excavates. A lie can't seal it. Truth. I've gotten away from process, but I think I can find my way back. Though it involves more self-disclosure than makes me comfortable, given the violence performed on the privacy of others who are necessarily included in the story. I will try to avoid lying, no easy task when my knowledge is so meager, and the keenest insights, the sharpest feelings come from speculation or derive from conflicting sources. But I can give a few facts. Their significance, by which I mean the poetics they yield me, will take more time. Three coordinates that define a plane, a ground of sorts for understanding. The first, age 10. For no discernible reason, no outward change in circumstance, I began pulling out my hair, small tufts at a time, twisting them into balls I kept in containers I hid in my room, though the hair pulling itself was no secret. It made a bald spot large enough that my parents eventually took me to a doctor. I eventually stopped, but all through adolescence, in periods of anxiety, I would revert to the practice, the pulling, the twisting, the keeping. Second, age 15. Ostensibly as a bar mitzvah present, an event two years past, I accompanied my father on a summer research trip to Israel. Our original intention was to stop in Berlin on the way home, the city where he was born and where an uncle, Werner, still lived. I suspect now that my father's plan was to tell me his story that summer, ending with a visit to the sites of his childhood. Instead, he began an affair. It eventually led to my parents' divorce, and the stop in Berlin was put off for an extended stay in Jerusalem. Only once that summer did a hint of self-disclosure come to the surface during a visit to Yad Vashem, when I watched him fill out pages of testimony, as they were called, for his murdered mother, Ruth, also my sister's name, grandmother, Julia, and an uncle, Erich, my middle name. Third coordinate, age 28. I at last worked up the courage to ask my father to tell me his story, and he consented, though the telling was put off for a year. But enough of this. Mass murder. I had a teacher in graduate school, Jill Robbins, who was fond of saying when aggravated, or really just any time, Dainu, enough already. Sometimes she would say it in German, Genug, enough already. That habit of hers and her crossing of languages roused feelings I'm still trying to think through. Dainu is a song, as you probably know. Sung at the Seder, it recounts the services rendered by God, each one punctuated by Dainu. It would have been enough. The point of the song is that manumission alone sufficed. Even if the Jews had been slaughtered in the Exodus, praise would still be due the Creator, a purer form of gratitude than I can manage. Gratitude brings debt, of course, and debt brings guilt. The two are one word in German. And with that transformation kept in mind, the song makes sense to me, or at least becomes a little more interesting. Slaughter is the very essence of Passover, and not only because of the drowning in the Red Sea, the story's cinematic essence, to be sure. What forces manumission is the mass murder of Egyptian children visited on their homes by the angel of death, who passes over those homes of the Jews. As the name of the holiday suggests, Pesach in Hebrew, this slaughter is what we celebrate, and here the we is truthful, let my own guilt be known. Pesach is also Paul Ceylon's Hebrew name, the name by which he was called in synagogue, and one day I would like to write about his work as a commentary on Passover, one long struggle with the logic of Dainu. But I cite him today for another reason. 
Before my father told me his story, Ceylon mediated my understanding of the silence. Conversation. I said before that slavery excavates an abyss between generations. My father and I stood on different sides, that's all. And yet our lives matched up somehow. Mine a parody of his, our coordinates aligned mysteriously. In 1940, when my father was 10, he and his parents were deported to the Wuj ghetto, the beginning of his servitude sewing leather pouches for the Luftwaffe. Four years later, they were shipped to Auschwitz, separated by gender, my grandmother murdered. As the war was coming to an end, my father and grandfather, Bernhardt, for whom I am named, the B anyway, joined a transport to the work camp Neuengamme, and from there they were sent by cattle car and death march to Ravensbrück, where they were liberated in 1945, six months before my father's 15th birthday which began a period of deliberation, whether to leave Europe for Palestine or the United States. When he was 29, my age, when he finally told me his story, I was born. Now, of course, I know he was telling me that story all along in a language I couldn't understand, a glacial language, I would call it, recalling a passage from Ceylon's conversation in the mountains. Zakder, Zakder, Hörst du, sagt er, und hörst du, gewiss hörst du, der sagt nichts, der antwortet nicht, denn hörst du, das ist mit den Gletschern, der, der sich gefaltet hat, dreimal und nicht für die Menschen. Says he, says he, you hear, he says, and hearest thou, of course, hearest thou, he says nothing. He doesn't answer, because hearest thou, that's the one with the glaciers, the one who folded himself up three times, and not for humans. I long took Ceylon's says nothing, he doesn't answer at face value, and one with the glaciers as a trope for my father, but glaciers do speak with excruciating slowness, tearing up the earth as they go. A glacier geschrei, a glacier scream, to borrow another figure from Ceylon, a neologism that doesn't so much communicate its meaning as preserve it as in a block of ice, muffling our hearing of what nonetheless becomes audible if we know how to listen. For in the conjunction of glacier and scream, gletcher and geschrei, the word scherga sounds, henchman. Anxiety. I had thought to begin this talk, not end it, with a thesis a fingernail, if you will, for the knot I wanted to worry, though I knew in advance the endeavor would fail. My life, anyone's, is not a sequence of knowable events, a string to be disentangled from the unknowable events of others. I am that knot. Yet the urge to undo oneself, or rather more precisely, to be oneself, though at risk in undoing, is strong. Hence my thesis, that influence, literature's most mysterious force, conscious or unconscious, obvious or hidden, generative or stultifying, is the making of knots such as those that make us, and that the urge to undo, or worse, cut away the knot, is here too strong. In what psychologists call intergenerational effects, the sequelae children manifest of parental injury, I find a compelling model for the workings of literary history not that literature is injured by nature, rather that the effects of injury are literary in expression, a mysterious force that maintains a complex relationship to acts of communication. My thesis is by no means new. We speak quite casually of literary parentage, of paternities and genealogies of poets, and Harold Bloom, of course, gave this way of speaking some rigor, a theory of influence as family drama. In Bloom's drama, the child would usurp the parents, not comprehend them, though influence is precisely a form of comprehension. His child's anxiety serves no heuristic function and is indeed not a residue of the past, but a stance toward it. Yet I love his famous phrase, the anxiety of influence, 
though I hear in it an anxiety originating in the past, an inducement to recapitulate what failed in that past, transmitted to the so-called individual talent as if by a parent, a parent who bequeaths to the child hope for a different outcome, influence is tradition as psychological process, a process that manifests in many more states of mind, thank God, than anxiety. Hope. Bloom's theory of tradition is modeled on the family. The family is conceived by Freud. A version of Bloom's theory truer to my experience would thus begin with a revision of Freud. And this is what I find in the work of Nicholas Abraham and Maria Turok, who developed a psychoanalytic poetics trained on a problem close to my heart. The effects across generations of interminable mourning. Their theory too takes the form of a drama. In one generation, the object of mourning is locked away in a crypt, kept secret, yet the secret escapes in the form of a phantom, which thereupon haunts generations to come. The intertwined fates of the generations is their most pertinent revision of Freud, at least with regard to a theory of tradition. As succinctly put by Nicholas T. Rand, their translator and collaborator, the concept of the phantom redraws the boundaries of psychopathology and extends the realm of possibilities for its cure by suggesting the existence within an individual of a collective psychology compressed of several generations so that the analyst must listen to the voices of one generation in the unconscious of another. That listening, which poetry too requires, is not passive but a hermeneutic practice. Abraham and Tarak developed that practice in their most influential book, A Reconsideration of the Wolfman Case Study, in response to what they call cryptonomy, a word that quite fittingly pays respect to a dead metaphor. The Wolfman's secrets, the deformations of language he produced, were not simply encoded but encrypted, were like a corpse entombed. The act of listening becomes more difficult, of course, when the secrets are not encoded, but ghostly. And I fear I am ill-equipped to hear such promptings. But then, it is not the dead I have struggled to comprehend, but their mourners. I have vivid memories of my father standing in synagogue to say Kaddish for his mother, as one does on the anniversary of a parent's death. And in later years, I asked him how he knew the date. <laughs> I don't, he said, matter-of-factly. I always stand. Now my father, too, is dead, is with his dead, as he was in life. I do not like the term survivor, he once wrote. The term erects a barrier between myself and all those who did not survive, both relatives and friends, and the multitudes I never knew. I much prefer the European usage, the French term deporté, or the simple former camp prisoner. With such terms, there is no abyss between myself and all those others, other former prisoners who died before the war ended, and all those Jews who also survived the Nazi era, but did so in New York, London, or Tel Aviv, cannot appropriate these terms. I don't believe my father haunts me. And though I don't go to synagogue, if I did, I would know the day to stand. He was a part of me, uncomfortably. And now that he is gone, I have lost access to that part of me I still don't understand. But this is where tradition fills a void. And so that's where I've uh, gotten with this. And I will just quickly add one footnote. Um, and we can have some conversation. This photograph was in Berlin in 1989. Uh, and this is the school my father attended for three years. He's the only student that survived. And here he is. And a month before his stroke, we were in Berlin again, and we did, went back. And then this is him there. Thank you.
thing that uh, interested me in the idea of influence, which is beginning to arise from your talk, is the uh, idea that um, influence might be marked by gaps or interruptions or distortions rather than by recognizable echoes. And in contrast, therefore, with the usual way in which we think of influence in literature, say something like Susan Stewart, when she writes about influence in verse, it's a matter actually of, of recognizing a sort of invisible choir of prior texts. But your idea of influence seems to me to be quite significantly different from that, the one that you derive from Abraham and Tolik, and one which um, is as much, well, almost by definition, cannot be recognized by the person who is influenced. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I, my tendency is to move in that direction, and at the same time, I'm, I'm very conscious of not wanting to um, in using psychological models of then um, turning literature into a malignancy and having the model be purely those examples that arise out of, out of states of distress or extreme, uh, extreme misfortunes. Um, and so I do think that those processes take many, many, many forms. And the ordinary forms of influence are, are clearly part of this. I mean, families share knowledge across time that's, that's preserved openly and celebrated. Um, but I do want to expand the notion of influence definitely. I mean, I think that of influence as, as just more generally, one of the ways we talk about literature is a shared enterprise. And, and literature is, is, is a collective achievement. We share it as readers and as writers, we belong as much to what we read as to what we what we write, and the idea of influence, which is somehow um, experienced as a shame, that's certainly what Bloom's model is based on. That that um, a great writer would not have visible influence um, seems to me that it that it's a blockage from appreciating the shared labor and the degree to which we're mutually implicated in each other's work and, and thought and experience. So to try and develop, which I am far from being able to do, to do, but to develop a notion of influence that would, that would accommodate these different ways of being involved in, 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 in our reading, um, to speak specifically about poetry and the way in which that reading shapes what we do visibly or invisibly, I think would, is something that, liter that, that literary study needs you know, very desperately. I, I think the, crit, crit, the, the idea of, of the author is a function that somehow it skipped the step, the idea that, that, that it's a mistake to think of literature in terms of individual achievement, but then it doesn't include collective achievement, it just includes amorphous historical forces, as if those forces, um, it skips what those forces act on, <laughs> so that we just have forces but not, peop but not, but not, um, yeah, but not subjects of it. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of work to be done, I think, in this. I don't know that if I, I hadn't thought about a continuum of terms that would differentiate impact from influence, but I am very, um, I mean, in, in terms of my work on, 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 for instance, on Emily Dickinson in the Civil War, um, one of the reasons that I've struggled with completing this work for so long is that I really am trying to, 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 to responsibly mark out a line between the, what is consciously produced and what is unconsciously produced. I, I think that there is a promiscuous way in which one is used to talk about the other as if the distinction was, was meaningless and also as if it was un, unknowable. Um, you know, my, my father was a historian of the Holocaust also. I mean, uh, many things that I would have liked to have included um, that, that I didn't. But, and so one of the complexities is the way in which he would speak about the event historically, not personally. But he, he detested what he called philosophizing. And <laughs> so I, a favorite response of his was always um, when someone would talk about the unrepresentability of, of an event uh, like the Holocaust, and he'd say, well, 
Well, we can represent a fair amount of it. And he would he would stand and give a list of <laughs> the numerous things that could be that could be represented, and uh, so I think finding where those boundaries are. You know, there's a, there's a way of speaking about limit cases, for instance. But limit means that there's a there's a point that you can go, and perhaps you can't go further. But so to mark out where that is and to see how far it can go is really important to me. So I, the the idea of an unconscious influence is really significant. And, but I'm, I always um, hesitant to make a claim for that. I always start by um, trying to understand how it might be um, conscious. Like the, the, the sherga in, in the Ceylon word is a good example. I spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out, um, because obviously words accidentally also produce these kinds of, of, of effects, whether that was a word that would have had resonance for him, whether it would have had meaning that he would have used it's a very particular word. And, and so one of the things I found, which, which I felt made me think that it was a formulation, he was making a statement, um, is the word appears in, in a Romantic era translation of Macbeth that I'm almost certain he knew. It's a really, um, it's a really, um, it's a famous translation by Dorothea Teak, which I think is Ludwig Teak's daughter. Um, and it's a, of a speech of, of, of uh, Banquo and oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. And uh, it's an it's a unbelievably great translation uh, that she made. And so, instruments of darkness is des uh, dunkels schergen, so the henchmen of darkness, uh, who erzählen Wahrheit, who, you know, who narrate truth, to us, and uh, yeah, in, in, in deepest consequences, vernichtend uns im letzten. So I mean, could translate that back as annihilate us to the last. I, it, it's, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And so I, you know, I look at this through Paul Celan's eyes, and it's like, okay, Schergen. So it, the, the glacier scream includes the instrument, which is, in this instance, an instrument of darkness uh, that 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 uh, that tells tells truth. It, so um, that's an influence. But it's just a, it's just a word. It's not, uh, it doesn't have a validity. It doesn't have an insurmountable validity. So it has a very tenuous hold in terms of the validity of interpretation. I'm married to a European. Um, her mother's side of the family was fascist. Her grandfather joined the fascist party um, and, and was some kind of officer. He was a, an academic in Syracuse in, in Sicily. Um, and uh, I have some pencils that belong to him. I, sometimes when I'm writing and I can't find I always like to say, like, where's my fascist pencil? <laughs> and, uh, and I love my grandmother dearly. Her, my mother's, my wife's, interesting slip, my wife's father um, from, was communist. His father had been in, in the Italian Navy, uh, and after the surrender, Bedolio was sent to Dachau. Uh, I, the Italian story is always so much more complicated than, than, than other places. You know, one of the things I respect about respected about my father was his, was his capacity to change, although I saw moments of reversion. And he had a, an aggressiveness and a hostility and prejudices when I was growing up that were kind of awesome to behold. I mean, he was a tiny man, and I saw him shouting at the top of his voice at very large people who would back away in fear. And I have an early memory of being tossed out of a movie theater back in the old days when they would show um, um, 
little you know film things before the movies, and they had a little f featurette about Oktoberfest, and my father was making a lot of comments about the Bavarians, and we got thrown out. But at the end of his life, my father was doing research in Germany, he was friends with officials. When we were there, I remember he had a, a discussion uh, which he was defending Germany's denazification as being far more um, profound than, than the German bureaucrats were, were doing. And uh, when we went at, um, when we went to, to Berlin before his stroke, it was because he was given um, a service cross by the, the, the Parliament of Lower Saxony. He had helped um, to establish the monument at Bergen-Belsen. That's a whole other story that's fascinating. Um, so he moved through different attitudes about that, definitely. I mean, he told me that he wanted to leave Europe. To him, it was a slaughterhouse, and he didn't want to stay there when he was a teenager. I mean, he came to the United States at 17. His father, who was a doctor, was in his 50s and didn't want to have to learn a new language, a new practice, and stayed, stayed in Germany. Married a communist woman whose children had been Nazis that she disowned after the war. Um, and uh, I did not know that he had married this woman. She was alive until the point when I graduated high school. I didn't even know that she had existed until after that. Um, so my, but my grandfather was accommodated to staying in Germany for whatever re reasons and married a, a non-Jewish woman there. My father did have very strong prejudices against Slavs towards the end. I mean, I think that that speaks to things that had, had happened in, in the camps and uh, he made some very bigoted remarks during what was happening in Yugoslavia about the Serbians and the Croats and uh, he, he definitely felt that the Serbians were um, getting their justice and you know, so he had many things still to work through, and I think I no doubt have many things to work through also. Um, I don't have, but so I don't have an aversion. And again, just using my own experience as a guide, I mean, the one um, qualification that I would make to the Abraham and Tarak formulation is it's very neat that one generation has the crypt, the other is haunted by what's in that crypt. And I, I'm not haunted by my grandmother's murder. I, I wonder about it. I would like to know about it. But I don't think that not knowing about my grandmother's murder has, has affected my personality at all. And I don't feel, and I've never felt compelled to, 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 to reprise my father's um, prejudices. I identified with my father up to a point, but especially after he started to tell me his life story, I ceased to identify with him. And it's my father uh, and, and, and what was going on with him and his treatment of me, conscious and unconscious, that fascinates me. Um, and so the idea of the phantom from the previous generation, I don't feel quite works. That's why I say I don't feel that my father haunts me. Um, I've certainly been affected by his loss. I mean, one of the things that I was going to write about um, that I excluded is the fact that I have not written a poem since he died, which is now two years ago. I've written a lot of language, things that I would ordinarily make poems out of, but I've, I've felt um, a kind of paralysis, which extended to this talk, which I will say I suffered over <laughs> for a long time, not because uh, psychological difficulty of, of writing, and, and, and it kept... Um, I wanted to write about influence, and I, and I couldn't, and that's why I made the self-disclosure. It was really the only way to do this writing. Um, but so the figure that I would use for this relationship, which is a horrible one, but in the nursing home, he got scabies, which often happens in nursing homes. And I got the scabies from him because it comes from skin-to-skin -skin contact. And it went misdiagnosed for a long, long time. And uh, actually, and then the drugs finally eradicated it from him Quickly, and it stayed with me for some whatever reason. I resisted the drugs for a long time. It's the most suicidal I've ever felt, it's just from itching. And uh, but, and he was paralyzed at the time, so he was locked in this itching that he couldn't scratch, and I was scratching with no relief. And the idea that these organisms that were living in me that had passed between us silently, and that what we were suffering from this itch was in fact the the debris that their corpses made. <laughs> That, I thought, has, is a trope that has some, <laughs> has some potential. <laughs> uh, but it's not, it has nothing to do with haunt, haunting and
crypts. And crypt, crypt the, the whole idea also, I mean, it's such a romantic uh, image, uh, it doesn't seem appropriate for 20th century horrors. So, um, It just seems like, it seems like an obvious parallel, maybe too obvious. When no, in, in not at all. I mean, I, I, again, this is one of the reasons why, why literature is, is a resource and art in general is a resource and a feeling. It's through, um, I mean, now there are organizations uh, of second generation and third generation and, 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 you know, shelves in the library about intergenerational effects. But when I was at, growing up, and the word Holocaust itself was, you know, abstruse. Um, it was in African American culture where I found my models. I mean, Robert Hayden's poetry, which is one of the, was the poet that really um, um, was the was my hook into writing. Uh, and his history poems about that experience was um, my vicarious way of understanding it. And a, a, a reggae song by Black Uhuru that 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 uh, I heard in in high school. Um, about doing, you know, physical labor and and they and in the chorus and they're singing, "We are the slaves," and it's you know it's the lines from the Passover Seder, and uh, you know the, that was the first time that I really understood what was going on in in the in the Seder, from which I was very disconnected um, psychologically. So I think that that's why, and as a teacher, I teach American literature, and uh, I feel like I have both enough distance and enough insight that when I teach about slavery, which is what I'm doing this semester, um, I bring something to it and it's use that, that's useful for the students and it's useful for me. And that if I was to teach Holocaust literature, uh, it would be a disaster, <laughs> be a continual crisis for me. Uh, so yeah, so it's another way that these knots really do have to involve crossings of cultures, not just um, intersubjective logics. Started out by talking about, yeah. and we we we've, we've been talking about it yeah. a bit anyway. And so, and you said that you're a real, a real reviser. Oh no, it's a it's a it's a disaster. I mean, this is this is this talk. I mean, it's right. you know, it's it's. Let me find a page. I would just do like a map of. It's like a horrible mirror that you look into, uh, which I guess makes it therapy, right? That's what it's supposed to do. Right? Yeah, it's just it's just a mess. I mean, writing yeah. the same sentences over anyway. It's um, I don't know. I mean, I used to think I was just a recovering child of the new criticism because that's how I was taught poetry and this idea that every word should contribute um, that had a disastrous effect. Uh, I'm still trying to overcome. It's like sometimes words can just be words and not contribute. <laughs> They're still members of society. <laughs> we owe them. Uh, so you know. I, yeah, so I don't, you know, I don't think all of it is just simply psychology. Um, some right. of it is just training. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I admire people who can write fluently. I saw the the, the manuscript of, of Tom Sawyer. Uh, it's got like one word crossed out. I mean, you know, if I could write that way, you know, I that would that that would be the my if I had one question to ask the genie. Let me write as fluently as Mark Twain. <laughs> it seems like the vision and influence are interesting to put that together because um, the revision is like a way also that like prolongs the time of writing the poem, right? So I'm like, you know, instead of first thought, best thought, it's like, it doesn't, you know, right. there's a different, I mean, there's another way of thinking about the kind of moment of the poem, and the revision is still within a kind of continuous moment of it. Right. Um, in which you can somehow like see your own history. And it seems like there's something maybe about revising and the cracking open that you somehow become aware of influence. Right. That you didn't know was right, that, that you didn't know was there or impact or something like that. 
Although things hide in it. I mean, it'd be interesting yeah. to hear what, what Stephanie thinks because it's sort of the counter to, ultimately, if, you're, if you have a calendrical kind of writing, it's dependent on the fact that, that what happens on one day Seriously. remains of that day. And so it just makes a, you know, it makes a knot of the temporal sequence of writing for sure when you do revision. No. Um, the, um, the kind of temporal problem, but like also to stay focused on the knots or something. Yeah. Yeah, the repetition. I mean, yesterday was, was February the 13th. It's a day that I always associate with Paul Ceylon because one of his great poems in Heinz is about various events of, of February 13th. It's the, it's the poem that, Paul, that Jacques Derrida writes about at great length in his book on Ceylon. And um, Ceylon, as far as I could tell, did not do a lot of revision. I've looked at the, 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 the historical um, alf alfgab of, of his work, and you know, sort of at the moment he does a few drafts, but it doesn't look like he does a lot of revision. It's a, it's, um, but, he, but dates are so important to him, and I think it is that repetition of return, um, but not necessarily of, of that return disappearing into the text. The different texts mark their their return in, in a sequence that, that is itself, um, and his poems are always published in chronological sequence. So, I don't I don't think that not would not be the right metaphor for what Ceylon, Ceylon does. Different f for Dickinson is a diff poet of equal significance to me, and her revision process and rewriting and things is much more. I feel close. I feel. I feel more kinship poetically with what Dickinson does than Ceylon. I feel, I feel capable of reading Ceylon because of childhood training, um, but I don't feel capable of writing in that, in that form. And I think it has something to do with this question of, of, of um, revision. This we get from the symposium. Well, I was just thinking that I had a, a friend when I was an undergraduate who had perfect recall. Mm. And he just found it impossible to write. Every mm. single thing that he wrote would immediately be obstructed by mm. consciousness of what it was ever forming, or reforming, or restating. Absolutely. And again, you know, just a good reminder that things shouldn't just be pathologized. I mean, there is positive, necessary, useful, health, life affirming uh, forgetting that, that makes space for something new, new to happen. Yeah. I think that's the difficulty for generating these theories is, is we, you know, we draw on our experience and they, they guide us to understand things, but then to try and imagine um, a structure for explaining things that can accommodate other experiences also. Well, it's upsetting for them to be applied. I mean, I know that John, I believe John Ashbury was quite upset by John Shoptor's application of mm -hmm. the Abraham and Turok theories to, to his work mm -hmm. um, and felt that um, it was an extremely tendentious account of, right. of, his, of his writing, very reductive. Yeah. It's very interesting to me that, um, to me what makes Abraham and Tarak interesting is the, is the conjunction of, of the cryptonomy and, and the phantom, and, and the fact that it's, that it's intergenerational. And the intergenerational element, by and large, falls away in literary critical appropriations. Yeah, it's the cryptonomy. It's just the fact that we could have a, a hermeneutics that's appropriate for things that don't seem to make any, any sense. And even with the rise of interest in hauntology, but that's a Derridian term, and it, it, it ignores Abraham and, and Tarak all, altogether. And uh, I mean, there are exceptions. Gabriella Schwab written a very interesting book, Haunting Legacies. Uh, and she writes in the chapter about her own experience growing up uh, as a German. Uh, in World War, War II. Uh, and she talks about both perpetrators and victims, and she writes about Native American literature. It's a very good book, and she uses um, to try and get an idea of transgenerational legacies in, in writing. But that's a rare exception. Um, so I, yeah, so I don't, I wouldn't see their, I wouldn't see their formulation as being appropriate for Ashbury either, uh, certainly in, in, in the idea of a cor corpse in his work. Well, they, they see they see kind of cryptograms of, of gayness everywhere in Ashbury. That, that, that was the 
Oh, yeah. But then corpse gets so gayness is a corpse. Cor yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I I know Shapdal's work on Emily Dickinson. He's a fabulous reader. Uh, it's how yeah, it's how things get stated. Well, I'm appreciative of the chance to um, to get these things said because um, for my own benefit of just making it public. I guess this is my version of standing up in the synagogue. <laughs> uh, yeah, verbalizing is 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 uh, is healthy, and and so I'm sorry that I didn't. Uh, the literary critical element of it is uh, enters slightly at the end, um, which would give us more to, more to chew on. Does this intersect with your Olson stuff at all? Uh, my readings of Olson are, are this kind of hermeneutic attention, I mean, of, of trying to make sense of very minute um, elements. And um, so in that sense, it is. I mean, I talk about, I call that book Intimacies because my desire is to try to figure out what is most, what are, what are the most intimate elements in Olson's writing where he is um, working things out and, and where are those things discernible. So in that sense, it's, I don't think it's necessarily a psychological reading, but it's made me pay attention to things that I've ignored and I guess so I guess it's related to that. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, thinking through of, of the precise ways in which he writes about sexuality, which, um, you know, the obviousness of his um, masculinism and, and, and homophobia m can make it difficult to see just how complex and varied his, his, his writings on those things are. I mean, just to give one, one ex example, and, and I'm trying to figure out what to make of all these things, there is an extraordinary amount of bestiality in Olson's work, and a lot of it is just simply mythological bestiality, which, but, you know, his, his history poem, There Was a Youth Named Thomas Granger, is about the, the, the first execution in the Americas, the boy who was found having sex with a horse and was hung by the Puritans. And lots and lots of other places, poems where he talks about uh, a bee buzzing in his room and, and he's in his bathrobe and, and there's something very um, intimate about this r relationship he has. And, 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 and so there are many, many other ways. And so, um, so the desire is to pay attention to things that, that, that would seem to be um, to the side of, of things and see if they actually create a coherence out of which some other understanding would be possible. Yeah, that seems very attractive because there's a tendency to read Olsen increasingly, or has been in terms of mapping and in terms of a sort of epistemological project or something which is Right. about to go, and, in, and also about recovery of documents and so on, but that ignores the whole side around process, which is so central, and the sort of white-headed and stuff as well, which it sounds as though your work will bear on. Right, yeah. I, I do feel that there's interesting work on Olson being done, done right now. He's sort of become available again to younger scholars and to mm -hmm. women scholars, which is really good news, because there's been, there was, for a long time, a strong aversion to him, which I certainly understood. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Well, thank you very much for that talk. I'm glad we could record it as well, so that if you now start to talk.